So let me introduce our panel tonight. Uh, closest to me, Judy Richardson, who, <laughs> yes. Um, she was Siri's senior research consultant and content advisor on Eyes, and she is now a senior producer at Northern Lights Production. Uh, next to her is Jack McDevitt, associate dean for graduate and research studies and executive director of the Institute on Race and Justice at Northeastern here. And <laughs> furthest away, Tracy Heather Strain. She's an independent filmmaker here in the Boston area and a former Black, Black Side producer as well. And I think maybe we can start with whoever wants to, a few words about seeing eyes coming up again. Um, let me just start, because what's interesting for me, um, we were on um, uh, uh, Talk of the Nation, NPR's thing this afternoon, and uh, Joe Asbell, whom you saw as the white reporter in here, um, his daughter called him, and she broke into tears because what she talked about was the power of seeing her father, whom she did not really, whose role she did not really understand, seeing him in Eyes on the Prize when it was first broadcast, and how much that moved her, and it moved her yet again just talking about it. And that's what the power of this series is. We storytell the movement. Now, what's interesting is that when, um, and I just got through doing this with like 70 teachers in St. Louis, Henry and, and Judy's uh, hometown on Saturday, and it moves people every single time um, because it's the power of the people's stories. That's what moves the series. Um, and so what's interesting is that, um, for example, when, when I first started with What Lies, it was the first incarnation of it, and it was 1978, and I had just moved to, um, to Boston, and two years before, Henry had asked me to give him a chronology, and I had done that along with, I'm sure, many other people, but because I'd come out of the, yes, because he always had, he had lots of coverage on stuff. Um, so, I and did so too. for the, yeah, and so for the first six months, I'm the only employee. Now, I know nothing about film. Can I just say this? Zilch, Zed Nada, about film. And so he's saying um, what he also always said, oh, nothing takes longer than six months to do. So I'm sitting up there researching by myself, um, and I'm looking through, and I'm, of course, not finding anything about anything other than Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. What this series does is it changes the way the, civil right, the, move, the modern civil rights movement is told, and it's told through what was real, which was the local people who are just like those of us in this room, and so that you identify with it because it's not just the humongously great Dr. King. It is people who look and talk just like you who are making these changes. Now, I will also say one other thing, because I only got four minutes in the startup. When we first started, um, it was going to be Capital Cities Communications, which had not yet bought ABC TV Network and sold it to Disney. It was just an independent you know, distributor, and they wanted to do a two-hour documentary on the civil rights movement. Or, <clears throat> They wanted to do minority programming. Henry proposed that it be a two-hour documentary of the civil rights movement. Okay, so this is 78, when we do some of the shooting for that Montgomery and the Emmett Till section. Okay, so he had another title, though. His title was America, We Loved You Madly. Now, this, is, this, had a, this had a rationale, though, you see, because his thing was to play on the word, you know, madly, and it was what Duke Ellington would say when he would come at the end of a concert, and he'd say to the audience, I love you madly. Okay, so I hated it. So for six months, I'm saying, Henry, I hate the title, I hate the title. Okay, so Steve Thayer, who was the series writer of Eyes 2 and was very prominent in Eyes 1, he sent me this memo that I had sent back in October 9, 1979. It says, Cap to Cap City folks from Judy, date, da da da, reprogram title. Okay. You all know how much I dislike the current working title. I have therefore perused Freedom Song titles for alternatives. Herein is the list. I am not wedded to any of these titles, although there are kind of, a couple I kind of like. I am circulating this mainly to get us thinking about other possibilities. Also, since they are all related to actual Freedom Songs, there's a tie-in musically. Also think about reworking. There is no order of preference on this listing. Okay, so there are 21. Starts with moving on, staying on freedom, we'll never turn back, which is one of my favorites. And number six is their eyes on the prize or keep your eyes on the prize. Now, number 21 is something. Now, number 22 has a little asterisk on it, and it says... We placed our trust in the Lord, Peren, and they beat the hell out of us anyway. And Peren. Okay. <laughs> and then the little asterisk says, my favorite. Okay, now luckily, Henry did not choose that one, right? Henry chooses number six. Now, Steve Fair mentions that up until air date, Henry is still thinking, oh, God, I've done the wrong thing. You know, they're going to make fun of it and stuff. Back to one serious point, and then I'll stop. Um, 
when, when I'm looking through the scholarship, and again, not finding anything that does not relate to Dr. King, I'm looking through Stride Toward Freedom. Now, Henry and I knew anybody who comes out of, came out of the movement knew that women were absolutely part of the leadership, were part of the troops. They were, you know, the strategizers and everything. Okay. So, but they're not anywhere in what the scholarship was at that time, 1978. Very little. Um, so I'm looking through Stride Toward Freedom, which is Dr. King's account of the Montgomery bus boycott, and I find Joanne Robinson. I go through all kinds of hell to try and find her. Finally, I call C. Gerald Fraser, who was one of the first black reporters at the New York Times, and I said, you know, Gerald, um, I found, you know, I know she's somewhere, but I'm not sure where, and somebody said maybe she's in L.A., and he says, because I had called him one too many times, and I was on his last nerve, and he says, you know, Judy, sometimes people are listed in the phone book, and she was, right? <laughs> now, I call her, and she tells me this incredible story over the phone, again, 1978, before they carry it through with the real series, right? And I'm listening to her, and she is so incredible, because at that point, she had not told anybody this story. And it's the power of the oral history. It's the power for her of remembering the amazing stuff that she and all these people did in concert together. So that's what this series is. And that's what, oh, and just so, yeah, Lou. Lou is sitting down there. That was her associate producer. Stand up, Lou. Stand up. Stand up. Lou. <laughs> and of course, in addition to being the producer director of this, um, Vecchio, Judith Vecchione was also like, the mother of the series. I mean, she had come off Vietnam series, had brought all of this about the fact book and uh, accuracy and all that stuff. That comes out of Judas. So that's the end. You got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> An easy act to follow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wanted to just mention, from an educator's point of view, something about how this series has been so important to us trying to um, teach people about what happened in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, I've used the Eyes on the Prize series to teach college students and to teach police officers about you know, what, what, what was this really like? And, and I, I, I'm always brought to pause when I started teaching, my hair had color, you know, um, I weighed less. Um, but I think now when I sit, in the freshmen coming into Northeastern, they were born in 1988. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 1988, okay? Um, the police officers who were going to the police academy were born mostly in 1985 and 1986. And even the folks who graduated law school and are now going to work as prosecuting attorneys and defense attorneys were born in 1980. Folks, I have to tell you that for them, the Montgomery boy bus boycott is like the Battle of Antietam. Mm -hmm. It's ancient history. It's something that I read about one time. I don't know what it means. I studied for a test, and I forgot it. I think that what this series does is it really brings that whole era to life for a new generation of people, for a new generation of folks who have to know about it. When I talk to police officers and they see how the police were part of the oppression in the South, where the police were the cause of violence so often, they see how it's so easy for them to be the ones who can be the problem, not the solution. A good friend of mine, Billy Johnston, used to always say that if people can't go to the police and they can't go to the courts, all that's left is going to the streets. Mm -hmm. And this film allows you that opportunity to see that. It speaks to young people who I have at Northeastern who want to be good constitutional police officers about how important the role they're going to play is, how much power they have and how important it is that they use it in a just and fair way. Another thing about it is when you're talking to young people and you say to them, there was a bus boycott for 11 months so that people could sit on a bus where they would like to. I mean, it's inconceivable to most kids today. It's inconceivable that somebody could hold together that long, that a, a group could have that much solidarity and you could bring that much together. I think it, it, it speaks on so many different levels. And another point that comes through this um, process, and you saw it a little bit, it's in some of the other segments, it's even more, 
is, is as a criminologist and sociologist, one of the things we understand is the way we keep strata in our society is by demonizing those people that we don't want to be part, the people we fear, the people we want to keep outside. And there's lots of ways we demonize groups. And you saw it a little bit with the Klan there and the crazy rallies and how they talked about people being mongrels, less than human, dehumanizing everybody as part of the process of demonizing them. And I see these things here and I fear that a lot of the debate we're now starting to see around immigration issues has some of the similar tones of what we've seen in here. So this is not just a historical series. It's a series that has much resonance today in society and the problems we're trying to deal with. So thank you. I'm going to be really brief. I'm very curious to hear what the questions are. But um, to me, um, this series represents a lot to me as a filmmaker. And I know other filmmakers of my generation feel the same way about this series. It's like the most important piece of um, television that we'd ever seen. It inspired us to become filmmakers, or if we were already in filmmaking like I was, to come and work at Blackside or do whatever <laughs> we could to get to work at Blackside. I mean, the next day after I went, I saw this, the first series, first show in the series, I went to my office and said, we're, what's this company, Blackside? I have to meet these people. And um, I have, I know many other people who worked at Blackside. Um, it was their same mission. I, they were going to do anything, no matter where they lived in the country. They were coming to Boston to work at Blackside. And um, the the reason that it was so, um, you have to remember, it was like the Civil War hadn't come out yet. This was like the Ken Burns Civil War. Ken, yeah. yeah. The, <laughs> <laughs> this, Ken Burns Civil War series hadn't come out yet. So this was also like the first really major event documentary. I can remember, I didn't see Vietnam, I know. That's I how know. young she is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, but for me, it was the first series that I was very curious about because I didn't know this history, and I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and they you know, were not teaching this history. So I had this emotional response as just an American citizen and a person who felt cheated you know, in my education. But then I had this professional response that, um, you know, it. And, and then once I got to Blackside, I have to tell you that it was they were very big shoes to um, live up to. <laughs> so um, we constantly on other series. I came there on the next series, the Great Depression series. We were always hearing about the eyes rules, and we always had to follow the eyes <laughs> rules. And uh, it wasn't until later, and like I'll make me a world that we actually could break some of the rules. So. Mm. I, um, I feel really blessed um, to have been able to work at Blackside and to have these big shoes to follow in. Um, I can ask you a question or I can throw it out open to you. Do you. Is there someone who has something they'd like to ask the panel or bring up for discussion? I see a hand right here. Yeah, the question was whether Eyes on the Prize was the first documentary that told the story, told its story from the black point of view. I would say it was the first historical series that did that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was the first dramatic program or individual documentary. I wouldn't think so. Mm -hmm. Right? When was that? What? Yeah, and, yeah. And that's the one that I, that was the only one that was out there. And unfortunately, it was all about Dr. King, so you didn't have, that's the one that didn't uh -huh. have anything about local movements, but you're right. And it also, and I don't it know also had happened. archival mistakes in it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you're right, there was that, yeah. There may Memphis have been Montgomery. programming out of any t New York. There was, low, I, I think there were some programs, but I, what Eyes was, uh, was really the, the second long, long form program that, we put out on the air that public television did and that Americans had seen. There had been one in Britain called uh, on World War II that they did. Um, and 
we then did Vietnam. And from that experience of telling a coherent history over many, many hours and telling it with the kind of rules that, that Tracy's referring to, which is it has to, it has to be journalistically completely sound. You cannot use a shot in a way that, it, that is misleading, that is not truthful. If it wasn't, those feet that you saw marching, this is, Lou, Lou and I went crazy over this, those feet you saw marching were marching in Montgomery. We had lovely shots of feet marching in other cities. You would never have known. We didn't use them. Um, we used music appropriately. The rules were different between Vietnam and ICE, but these sorts of um, uh, uh, limits that we set to ourselves, and we set them not to make life difficult for ourselves, but because we knew that audiences were becoming increasingly sophisticated and really needed to feel supported. They're telling me the truth. I can trust them. I was struck again watching this. I, I think of this periodically, how blunt we were about calling things what they were. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure scripts are as blunt these days. Uh, people are a little more careful. But we felt we could say it. It was, you know, segregation was what it was. Uh, the, the rules of, you know, stepping aside, whatever. So I don't know. Just, yeah, just two things. One is, um, I, I was on this, this panel at the Academy Award thing, and it was because they were doing a panel on documentary filmmaking in L.A., and it was because two filmmakers had gotten the Academy Award for documentary who had used, who had um, made it seem that something was archived, that a lot of the footage was archival, and it wasn't, and it had been recreated. And so on one of the, and it was on the um, Birmingham children, the Children's March. Um, and what was interesting to me is sitting on that panel that I was the only one talking about, again, your rules, which was you don't use um, footage as B-roll. In other words, it can't be just wallpaper. If you're saying that it was used in Birmingham, it's not supposed to be from Albany. So every time I saw the Albany young people in a mass meeting, you know, singing back and forth, and they're sitting in Montgomery, um, it drove me crazy. And I say, you know, look, you can't do that because young people would not have had that kind of... Mm, at that point in Montgomery. It was an adult movement. So to put them in Montgomery doesn't make any sense, aside from the fact that it's untrue. And that young people, it's what you're saying, that young people, one of the things teachers tell me is that sometimes young people do not believe that some of this stuff happened, that they could talk about it till they were blue in the face. They don't believe it until they see it in black and white in something like Eyes on the Prize. There is a reason why Eyes got an Academy Award nomination, six Emmys for the, eight, the, for the 14 hour series. And by the way, can I just do a little plug? Please call in WGBH after this airs, because whether we see the second series of Eyes on the Prize, where you see Dr. King going against the war, talking about needing a radical redistribution of economic power, whether you see any of that is dependent on whether PBS feels that you like the first series and want to see the second, which is eight hours. Okay, so um, what... Oh, I lost my thread. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Somebody else want to pick that up? Or? Uh, I'll, I'll just pick up the... Again, from the educator's point of view, the, the, the folks, the young people who are in school today and the police that are in police academies, these are people who learn better from a visual medium mm -hmm. than they do from sitting with a book, much to the chagrin of a lot of us. But still, <laughs> it is the case that when they sit in front of and get a chance to immerse themselves in the series, what, what tends to happen is a whole bunch of other things get tripped in their heads that come out later on, that they remember that it isn't something that, that they can immediately go out and talk about, but it comes out his, over a longer period of time, and it really challenges some of their views. And I think the integrity of the film is a huge part of that, that, that they can see that this is a film made about a time, and they get to see the, really the texture of that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's important. Anybody? I see a hand up here and one back there. I'll take you and then that. Yeah, please. Uh, this is a question for the panel. Folks, I've heard the phrase a lot of uh, integrity in film, which goes hand in hand. If you have a film, uh, you can look at it and you can say, okay, this is the original footage. This has been, or this is at least a, a true copy or a true image of what the makers wanted us to see. Uh, in this, as we've seen recently, in, in uh, recent times, Tools are available for citizens and the, the local people that you, as you, as you spoke of in this film, the local people to make their own images. They're much easier. You have handy cams, you have video cameras, you have blogging, you have 
digital cameras and cell phones that can take video. And as this, as this happens, we see now a blizzard of images of all kinds of real-time newsworthy events, movement and otherwise. Does this, in your, sorry, here's the question. Does this make it easier or harder to do a film with the power or the integrity or the mission of Eyes of Christ? Because you can't, I mean, there's so much material, so little of it's archival, and it's video, not film. You don't know where it's from. Tracy too. Well, I think that I think that this new media environment is really exciting because there are all these new tools and people feel empowered. But to be a professional filmmaker is actually a lot harder right now because it's more difficult to raise money, and it, and it's it's a real challenge and it's difficult to get um, your work seen. Um, people, if you go to a meeting and you say your project costs X amount of money to make because you have these journalistic standards. It doesn't, you, it takes time to read all the books about the civil rights movement or dig or try to find Joanne Robinson. It, you know, it doesn't happen in, in two weeks. Uh, well, if, it would have if you opened the phone. But sometimes it takes a long time to find people, to find the right person. I mean, they were literally looking for the people that were in some of those shots. So you have, that takes some time. Today, people don't want to spend that time or spend the money to allow you that time to do that kind of research. So it's very challenging to do that kind of, this kind of work now. And could I just say, I also think that people, everybody and his mother thinks that they can make a film, which is a problem. So that when you bring a budget that is solid, um, they don't understand it because, I mean, and I would go back even to eyes. When I remember Mrs. Devine, who was this incredible lady, who she was part of the triumvirate that was part of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. It was she, um, Mrs. Gray from Hattiesburg, and, and Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer um, from Sunflower County. And so they were the, the, the bulwark of that, um, uh, that the party that, um, challenges the all-white Democratic delegation at Atlantic City in 1968, which is chronicled in the fifth hour of the first series. So um, when I called her to get to see if she would be able to be willing to be interviewed, um, she was very nice, but she said, no, we're going to make our own film. Now, the problem was they didn't make their own film, um, and she's not really in the piece except in archival footage. She was so amazing. She would have been such an amazing interview. But everybody thinks they're going to do their own film and don't understand, I think, the, the standards that are required of broadcast and all of that. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm a tremendous, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I'd like to get more questions. I'm, I'm a tremendous fan of citizen journalism, but I think it's not the same thing as professional journalism. It's got enormous value. We are enriched by it, and we need to find ways to connect with the, with the citizen journalists, which is what your, you know, grassroots journalism, whatever these things are called. But it, it, we're in a transition now. It's not real clear whether it's going to end up undercutting or supporting what we all care about. I had a hand over here and then another one over here. Can I, can I, you, yeah. Okay, I have two questions about media because it, it's very clear from the film how powerful the media is in changing our impressions and even how powerful it is in the free broadcast. With the Emmett Till case, I was curious about two things. One was um, the, the video footage of the funeral, whether that was broadcast on TV, and the second one, was if you found differences in how the, the photographs and the story was told in the white press versus in the black mm. press at the time. Mm. Um, I don't think that film, I, look at Lori, I don't, Lori, I don't think that film was shown at all. I mean, it might have been shown locally. Um, but I don't, it certainly didn't have the kind of national distribution. You're talking about a time before national news. Remember, national news starts in 63. So you don't even have an outlet for it. You're sort of the, the opposite end of right now where everybody can put video up on anything. Back then, there was enormous, there was scarcity. You couldn't, you couldn't get anything up. What was powerful was the photograph of Emmett Till, the, 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 of the corpse, and it was powerful in the black press because that's where it ran. Mm -hmm. It didn't run in the white press in the same way. So there was a, there was a lot of difference. Um, person out back there, I can't see who this is. This looks like a familiar face. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think know. it is. <laughs> There's another reason to do it right, and that is any film of consequence is going to be attacked. And the one thing you need to know is if you did it right. And that's your own 
That's well. That's a, that's. A, did, did everyone hear this? Um, the assumption is that if you're doing any film of consequence, you're going to be attacked, and your only defense is to have done it right. Um, sometimes it's nice if you get attacked from both sides, then you really feel good about it. <laughs> <laughs> and you should know about that with Vietnam. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> and my China films. Oh my lord. Could, could I just add one thing, which is, it also do not forget that this is a black man running a black film company, Black Side, that's what it's called. Sometimes we got envelopes saying Backside, but <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was Black Side, and he had never done anything like this before. And so in addition to all of the rules, you know, and the journalistic grounding that Judith is bringing in, it is also Henry coming out of communications, Henry knowing as a, a black producer going on PBS telling a civil rights movement story, you got to get it right. Yeah. Because in my family, we take the, and I've seen this so many times, <laughs> the old age case. Um, when I first saw it, so it was 12, 13, and in watching the episode of the interrogation, it's my discovery that my father and his siblings, these are very favorable to school. Mm. Which, he just right there just kind of casually mentioned it. Like, oh, yes, I did that too. <laughs> Whereabouts? <laughs> um, he was in Indianapolis. Wow. And more recently, I discovered that the key to my grandparents' house says, do not sell to me. But they got it sort of secretly. And I was wondering if, as a teaching tool, if you have other ways of sort of encouraging kids to talk to people in their family about it. Because mm -hmm. part of it, right, what's so important is, is that it's oral history and it's like, you know, your next door neighbor telling you all these amazing, insane stories like, how did this possibly happen? And I was wondering if there's a way to encourage people to I think there, there, that that yeah, is I part of the yeah. And I actually I do it when I show the clip of Freddie Leonard. Freddie Leonard is in the Freedom Ride section, and he's talking about um, holding on to his mattress. And um, when I mentioned how Orlando Bagwell got that interview, and the fact that when we showed it, what Freddie said to me was that he had not even told his children. And at the time that it aired, it was, um, he was unemployed. He was an unemployed um, uh, craftsperson. And how his children looked at him differently. Um, you know, that he, he both, Freddie Leonard and his wife had been part of the Freedom Rides and had never mentioned that to their children. Same thing, right. Now, when I talk to teachers about it, I say, you know, this is the importance of oral history. And in fact, one of the times that, um, well, I won't go through that. Yes, it is important, and to talk through, um, there are a lot of places where you can do that, where they talk to folks about what were their parents or any people in the neighborhood doing during that time, what were they thinking, and sometimes they find surprising stuff that maybe they didn't want to know, but it's, it's interesting. If a certain amount of what, what is in these films is also material that nobody had seen or heard before that was sitting in attics. A, a certain amount of it got thrown out. We, we can tell story after story of calling television stations in the South or whatever, wherever you were telling the story and them saying, oh, yeah, we, we erased that a long time ago. We threw all that out in 1960, whatever, and your heart stops. But some of that, that Holt Street Baptist Church uh, audio, the actual sound of uh, Martin Luther King speaking on December 5th, the people singing, um, was you know retrieved from someone's attic. It was it was a, a brilliant piece of preservation that I think is it Lori? Is it Lou? Yes. Is it both of you? I don't. I I think it was Lou who did this. No, mm. I think it was Lou because I think I remember that. Oh no, that, that, that's another part of the story. But it took <laughs> it took all of his extremely famous charm to get this. <laughs> Please. I'll go through before, but I'm not going to do it again. There's a team of people in this room that helped get eyes rebroadcast. They have worked tirelessly for two, three years, and I think they need to be acknowledged. Absolutely. 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 Allison. Cindy, Rena, could you stand? Sandy, who else is here? Sandy's not going to stand. She told me to get over it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cindy, okay. Here, we have a lot of people now. Yay! Rena. Rena. Do it. And we just didn't have the money to 
money and couldn't do it. I, I am so enriched to hear you reacting to it. Sandy came along, and Sandy's relentless. <laughs> and this group of people tirelessly worked to get the series to come back. So I just think Good for you. Good for you. But I think people need to acknowledge what they did because it's going to be on the air again because of all the hours that they spent working and fighting and whatever to get it back. So I feel privileged to work with the Greek broadcast team. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask uh, the panel, what, that was 50 years ago, what has really changed in America when we start with the elections of the presidency in 2000 and what happened in Florida? And what happened in Ohio. In Ohio in 2004, and Katrina, and I could go on in terms of the number of black men who are incarcerated in this country, the fact that 50% of the children in the Boston public schools drop out. What has really changed in America in, in those 50 years? Well, I will say one thing. I mean, if, if you assume that one of the things we were trying to do, one of the things in the movement, was to get black people registered to vote without getting them killed. Okay. If you assume that at least was one of the goals, um, then at least we've done now. Now, what the problem we had is that we stopped being vigilant. So that you could have, for example, Awan Williams who wrote with a lot of help from the production team um, that uh, first companion volume at the very end of Eyes on the Prize. Um, and, you know, he now has an op-ed in the New York Times talking about how the Republicans really, you know, are just not getting their message across to African Americans. Uh, they're just not framing it properly. Doesn't talk about the assault by the, the Republicans on the African American vote. Just, it's just, you know, um, they're just not framing it. And so his last line is, fortunately, Mr. Bush, though, you have a lot to say. Now, you will always have people like that. You will always have Juan Williams, black conservatives, all that stuff. Um, but what I always, what it seems to me to have happened, though, is that we have an awareness of ourselves that I never had growing up. I have a sense of my strength. I have a sense that you can change stuff. Now, my problem is that we haven't enough given that to the young people, black or white. I mean, when I go on campuses, what's amazing to me is the number of young people who will say, you know, I'll be doing something and it'll be I and, and two other people who are in the, in the committee. Now, of course, part of the problem with eyes is that it makes it seem like we started the movement and then in six weeks we were marching across the Selma Bridge with 20,000 people. And it never happened that way. And if all the people who were in the movements who say that we're in the movement, we're in the movement, we'd be free now. You know? <laughs> so it's not in all of that gets changed. But there are some, some things that, um, that I could go into Jackson now, you know, unlike what happened in 1963, and that um, I wouldn't be arrested. Now, if I'm in Guantanamo, I can, be sit, I can sit there forever and nothing will happen. You know, I'll never have a lawyer, nobody will know my name, and I could die in there and nothing would ever happen. And we have allowed that to happen, but I can't go into that because I'm really talking about the movement. Um, so so I, I will say, yeah, there are a lot of important things that have changed, and I think part of the problem is that we sometimes re forget what it was like back then. Not that there aren't problems now. I think one of the things we lost, though, was our sense that we could really change stuff. And, and I guess I would say, too, that one of the things that's different is that we still have prejudice. We still have racism. bigotry, racism. Those are all with us. But they've become a little bit more subtle. And they've become, they attach themselves to issues that aren't about beating people in the streets or lynching. But the research that we've been doing at the Institute of Race and Justice, my colleague Amy Farrell, things like hate crime. Hate crimes haven't gone away. People are still being beaten because they're black or because they moved into a white neighborhood. Racial profiling. Just because the media doesn't talk about it anymore doesn't mean car stops aren't being made where people's lives are being disrupted because of who they, what they look like. And most recently, the whole issue around human trafficking and you know, trading people into slavery on our streets in the city, in Boston. 
is stuff, absolutely, is stuff that is happening and people have to have it brought to their attention because a lot of people who want to believe we've already achieved success and that we, we can move on to other problems now and we can. Yeah, I would add one more piece, which is that we have a vocabulary that we could, we, we can use to push these issues forward. Whether we do or not is another one, another point. But we have a vocabulary and we have tools in the period of time earlier than, than this. Um, it was very hard to even get those tools to get to be heard in any way. So while we have enormous changes, we have enormous work to do also, absolutely. And I guess our hope is that this kind of um, discussion can be pushed out using eyes, using the stories of our own families, using whatever is good um, to make those conversations happen and to make people more active around these issues. Um, I, can, I should probably be wrapping up, or I, I've got one more question I can take. Um, Somebody I, in the back. I see way someone back. way back. I'm sorry, I've got some of it, it, like. The question is what what stories are being told now that are about today's right. right. Well, I would say that um, that the legacy of Eisner Prize are in the people that work there. Um, that we all. Everyone who's worked there has been inspired by this series in one way or another, and people have gone on to try to carry forward um, the kind of standards, the, um, the interest in this kind of subject matter into our work. Right now I'm working with Lou on a series on health disparities. We've worked before together on a series about race, it was called Race the Power of an Illusion. Judy does work at Northern Light, working on different um, historical, historical documentaries. documentaries. There are different people across the country um, who are continuing to work in this tradition, and, um, and even though the company is uh, no longer functioning as it was um, during the making of Eyes on the Prize and other series. You're right. I mean, that we are all doing various work, which is amazing. I mean, that's where, and, and beyond us, beyond us, um, there are people who are coming out. If you look at POV, for example, if you look at Independent Lens, if you look at some of the series that is non-traditional PBS, for example, um, if you look at some of the things that come out of Frontline, for example, you will see some of the younger filmmakers who are doing some incredible work um, taking up justice issues. There's, there's room for more. It's a tough life, though. I mean, if you're looking for an easy birth, it's not, it's not that. But um, I don't think anybody goes into documentary work thinking they're going to get rich. Um, I, I think 